Hi, I'm Elise and I run I Fucking Love Science. I'm here to announce that I'm shortly going to be launching an IFLS YouTube channel. I'm really excited. The basic idea is that it's kind of going to be the best of the IFLS Facebook page in video format. I'm going to go through the best posts, the best jokes, the most interesting papers that have come out, everything that really grabs me. I sometimes worry that a lot of people get it into their head at a very young age that science is boring and science is scary and science is intimidating. And it shouldn't be like that. I mean, yes, science is hard, of course it is, but it's more hard work than anything else. And there's a basic understanding of science and scientific education and literacy isn't beyond anyone, anyone who wants to work at it. And it's so worth it. But because so many people get into this idea of it being this terrifying, scary thing, but done by these old men in white coats, they don't even try. So what I really try to, be, to, to, to do is keep it as unintimidating as possible, keep it as light and as fun. And there's so many links and there's so many, I'm always sending people to all, all the different areas of the internet, but it's just that, that first level that keeps it so fun The humour is your lens, isn't yeah, it? That's absolutely. your kind of curatorial yeah. point of difference. I mean, th this point of being put off early on mm -hmm. from the sciences, it happens in high school. Why didn't you get intimidated? I always found science very easy. It wasn't a passion. It wasn't something I was in love with. It was a very practical decision to go and study at university. It felt like common sense. You know, if you want a good job, you're not really sure what you want to do, do a science or a maths degree. That just makes sense. And then I got to university and I was being taught by all these passionate, engaged people who were so clearly completely in love with their field. And I was learning all this amazing stuff and not just learning it, but going out on my own to learn it. Because obviously at university, it's not just learning by right. You have to go out and do your own research. And I remember sitting there day after day and having my mind absolutely blown by what I was learning. I remember sitting there in lectures thinking, why doesn't everyone know this? How, how is it possible that there are all these people, all these millions of people out there going about their lives and doing these things and they don't know what I've just found out? Exactly. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so I, mean, I just want to tell them. Aside from the humour, what do you think is captivating people? I think the name helps. In a big way. I mean, it's either you love it or you hate it, but either way, you can't ignore the it. The big F-bomb in you the middle of it. You cannot ignore it. You have to go and look. <laughs> so I think that helps in a big way. But I also think there's such breadth in the page. I mean, I get emails from people who are students. I get people from emails from people who are, are PhD lecturers. There's so much in there, and I try really hard to keep it as varied and as random as possible. So there's something in there for absolutely everyone. So even if you, you took science in high school and haven't even looked at it since or if you're a PhD lecturer studying molecular biology, there's something there that you will enjoy. Some people think that science takes the wonder out of the world. Nonsense. I don't, I, I, that, that, that baffles me. That absolutely baffles me as to how anyone can think that, how learning more about something can take the wonder out of it. I mean, you look at the stars and they're just pretty points of light in the sky. You know, that, that's very pretty, but that's all there is to it. Whereas once you know about it, once you learn about the physics behind it and what it is, and, and that just blows your mind. It's interesting observing how people attempt to engage people with science, you mm -hmm. know, that, because there are a few different approaches and the popularisation of science is often about s sort of a freak show, a circus show, mm -hmm. liquid nitrogen bombs and, you know, bubbles and, and the carry on. And, and that can be a good thing to mm -hmm. a point. But does it actually build literacy? Absolutely. I, I really believe it does. I'm not really trying to teach anyone anything. I'm trying to get them to that point where I was at university, which is the, hey, this is really cool. I want to know more about this. I'm going to go and look this up. I'm going to go check a book out of the library. I'm going to go watch a documentary. I'm going to go find out about this on my own because that just sparked my interest. The Australian Academy of Science, Elise, uh, just did a, a survey of scientific literacy mm -hmm. and their approach is to ask a subset of Australians six scientific questions, basic questions. This is going to upset me, isn't it? One of the results was that more than a third of Australians don't know how long it takes for the Earth to orbit the sun. What do you think about that way of measuring literacy, though? Because I often think that it actually gets people to feel shameful about what they don't know rather than celebrate what they do know yeah, in terms can... of scientific literacy. Obviously, I don't want people to feel ashamed, but it is shameful as a society that there are so many people that don't know these basic facts. That is a huge problem. I mean, this is the world around us. We should want to understand it. I mean, it all comes down to education, doesn't it? And it all comes down to the way, I think, the, the way the curriculum is built for science is it's, it's, a lot of it is involved in memorization and learning things by rote. I mean, I don't know the period table off my heart. I never have to. I, have to. I just look at a periodic table that is about the understanding of these things, about the understanding of the bonds, of the chemical bonds, of what's going on within the molecules and within the elements. That's what matters. And we don't focus on that. Who are your scientific heroes? I have too many to list. I think um, one of them we share, actually, that 
wonderful Rita Levy Moncelcini. I love her. Tell us I about l- your connection with her. I, I really only learned much a lot about her after she passed away, which was a real shame. But after I looked at her life and looked at how determined she was to be involved in the sciences and to stay involved no matter what the world threw at her, whether that was a father that didn't approve, a society that didn't approve of women being involved in the sciences or a world war. Fascism. She just kept going. She did, didn't she? She won a Nobel Prize. Yeah. She only died in December at 103, yeah. still working in her lab right throughout her 90s. Yep. Incredible, isn't it? She was it? an absolutely astonishing woman. A woman. So at some point in the last year, it became clear that you were a woman curating mm. this page. Describe the fallout when people found that out. I was at a conference and I hadn't really been updating the page very much and a, a colleague had just recommended me to start using Twitter and I was really struggling to get into it. And somebody suggested I put my Twitter page on the Facebook page and ask people to tweet me cool people. So I put it up on the Facebook page and I said, you know, send me some people that I should be following. And then I was busy all day and I came back to it at the end of the day and there was a comment thread of about 10,000 comments (laughs) all saying, oh my God, you're a girl. Because you'd, you'd pop your photo up on your yeah, Twitter because, profile. Yeah, my, on my Twitter profile there was my face. It was more than, oh my God, you're a girl. There was a few, I mean, I like to term it benevolent sexism. This is so hot. Oh my God, that's so sexy. I love oh science even more. Yeah, you're a girl and you're into science. <laughs> that's so hot. Like, come on, really? <laughs> then articles started coming out about it, about the reaction. You know, a lot of people just commenting about how insane it is that in the 21st century, all these comments were coming up. And then there started to be a reaction to the reaction and that's when things got quite abusive. Um, lots of comments were along the lines of she deliberately kept her gender secret to cause a big fuss. And I remember thinking, my name's been in the about section. You know, if anybody had wanted to find out, they could have found out in a heartbeat. It's just no one cared. Why would they? A Facebook page was set up that photoshopped my picture onto softcore porn pictures. Get out of here. Yep. I actually messaged the, the page and I was like, look, I, I can take a joke as much as anyone else, but this is not okay you can't do this to somebody I felt this is really inappropriate and I I felt like it's really invasive can you please stop and they were like you should expect this you're a public figure it comes to the territory I'm just thinking I don't remember being told this I don't remember being told because I want to talk about science that people are entitled to do that but a lot of these people are kind of crazy I'll get messages I'll get you know people track down my personal email address they'll send me messages they'll say some really horrible things I've been accused of being a, a, sh- a shill, of being paid by um, Monsanto, by biotech companies, by pharma companies, by the US government, even once by the NRA, which is the National Rifle Association in the Do US. Do you take money from anyone? No, but just throwing it out there, if Monsanto wants to get in touch and pay me hundreds of thousands of dollars to say nice things about GM Foods, you know, Should... they can find me. Well, well okay I mean, that. That, so that's the challenge of your success, isn't it? <laughs> that you, you will be courted by different interests. And you are unashamedly uh, pro-science. Yeah. How do you see, I guess, the nature of the debate around climate change publicly now? Issues like climate change and like vaccines and like evolution have become very politicised today. And sometimes I feel like the media spins a controversy when in the scientific community there really isn't one. I mean, speaking of climate change, a study came out a few months ago that found something like 99.7% of published literature agrees that man-made climate change is occurring. And yet if you were to read a popular science article in a newspaper or a magazine that wasn't a specific science magazine, you would be given the impression that there is so much more of a debate about it when there isn't. Mm. Your Facebook page, each one of those posts would be the kernel of a fantastic discussion in a classroom. Yes, absolutely. But then there's the F-bomb. Kids do love that. Teenagers do love that. I completely understand the perspective of parents. And I do have a mirror page, which is called Science is Awesome, which has all the same content, but without the swearing. Without without the sweary bits. But chances are your kids will find IFLS on their own. And chances are they will love it because it will feel a bit more edgy. It will feel a bit more different. It will feel like something they're not having to do because their teacher told them to or because their parent told them to. And I never ask for credit or anything like that. If you're a teacher and you want to take something from the page, just take it. It's what it's there for. You don't feel the, you know, you don't need to put on your blackboard from Love Science. You don't need to do that. Just just, just take it. I'm giving it to you. Use it. <laughs>